Okay, so I think we are at least set. I'm sorry you can't see uh, the stuff projected, but it really doesn't make much difference because it's not diagrams or pictures or anything. Uh, so first of all, and I might say feel free to interrupt, to ask questions as I go along, to argue, whatever. Why do we want to use case studies is the first issue that I want to raise. And maybe I'll ask you, why, why most all of you said that you are using case studies, why do you? Besides the fact that maybe it seems easier than collecting a lot of data and running it through a computer. But do any of you, can any of you give a more general explanation as to why you might use case studies? Yeah? Um, I guess for a more qualitative approach. Okay, uh, so it provides a qualitative approach, but what is that supposed to mean? I mean, we teach courses that are called qualitative methods and quantitative methods, so okay, it's a qualitative I, method. I guess um, looking more for like the story of the place. I'm sorry? Like for the stories, like for a story behind? Right, it tells the story behind something. Uh, yes. Um, I want to see the application of my question somewhere in a, in a tangible context. Okay, so it provides a context for whatever it is that you're looking at. You can, it tells the story, it provides the context. Yeah? Um, when the, the situation is not in the control of the researcher, um, it provides the means to uh, find a logical answer? Right, good. So the researcher can't control the experiment. Uh, there's an effort always in the social sciences to be like science to somehow be able to make statements that are within a positivist framework that you can simply say this is true or not true. Well, you can't even say something's true, but you can say it's not false. Uh, but the problem is that uh, it's one thing to be able to falsify in a laboratory, uh, but it's another thing to falsify within a, genu within a social context. Uh, so what case studies are good for then is to focus on how things happen, why they happen, and what are the results of their happening. If you're really good at doing it, you're able then to stand back and make certain kinds of generalizations about process. Uh, case studies capture the dynamics of process in a way that statistics can't. Now, uh, what uh, something like regression analysis seeks to do is to, in a way, artificially uh, go from cause to effect. Uh, but what that really relies on is saying, well, if X, then Y, but it doesn't really tell you if X, why Y happens. So what you typically see in articles that rely entirely on regression analysis and case study analysis is that there's a great, most of the articles taken up with um, uh, the regression, which then tells you that in whatever percentage of cases, if you have this factor, then the other factor will occur. And then at the end, there's maybe a page of wild speculation as to why this might be, uh, without really anything but, but kind of, well, we think that this is the reason. Uh, but it, using numbers doesn't really tell you the reason. Uh, now, case study analysis can employ a variety of kinds of evidence, uh, both direct observation of what's happening, I'm, super, or I'm not supervising, but I'm on the committee right now of an anthropology student at Harvard uh, who's writing on planning in Bogota. So what he, being an anthropologist uh, rather than a um, planner or rather than a, um, an economist, uh, what he essentially does is hangs out in neighborhoods to try to find out what the impact of planning policy in Bogota is. I don't know if you're familiar with Bogota, but there's been a lot of planning in Bogota and a lot of clearance of spaces. Uh, and there's been a lot of very positive publicity about how wonderful it is. They've cleared the square. They've gotten rid of the informal vendors. Uh, but what he talks to are the informal vendors who've been gotten rid of, which gets you quite a different uh, outlook on what's happening in Bogota. So he uses direct observation. He uses interviews. Uh, everybody, of course, uses documents and secondary sources. Uh, but you also, in fact, can use descriptive statistics. You can use focus groups. You could even use inferential statistics. A lot of the theses I've supervised have started out uh, with looking for certain kinds of statistical generalizations, like one that um, I supervised some years back 
was attempting to find out why uh, financial corporations located uh, where they did. So she took the whole United States and uh, did a statistical summary of where big accounting firms were located. Uh, then she found that uh, uh, they were located more, much more often in the center city than in the suburbs. Uh, then she picked uh, what was actually, she picked Chicago, uh, which um, had the second largest group of accounting firms. Uh, New York would have been better, but that was just in the aftermath of, I think, 9-11. So uh, where firms were located was kind of fraught at that time. Uh, so she took Chicago and having used statistical analysis to say this is where she found a cluster, she then interviewed the people in that cluster in order to find out why uh, they located where they did. Uh, interestingly, what she found uh, was something I had always disagreed with but then had to modify my views, uh, that um, they actually said, well, we went where there was vacant space. Now, I had always argued that uh, cities which subsidized speculative, or speculative office development in the hopes that if they produced this space, something would land in it, uh, were misguided. But it turns out that it isn't so misguided as one might think. I had made the com comparison to a cargo cult. But as it turns out, uh, if you're a firm and you're rapidly expanding, uh, you don't want to sit around and wait while somebody builds the space. So you'll go to where space is available. Uh, but at any rate, she did a case study of several of these firms uh, where she was able to find out what the logic was of what people were doing. Uh, another thesis that just finished that I supervised. Sorry, Susan, can yeah. I ask you what sure. really got to the bottom of that issue there was key informant interviews? Wasn't yes. That? Right. So she went to each of the biggest firms and interviewed the vice president in charge of finding office space for them. Another thesis I, that just finished was a fellow uh, who was looking at the sources of innovative high-tech industries in Beijing and Dublin and, whether, and what could explain it. Uh, so uh, he interviewed people in these indigenous, that is he didn't look at foreign firms, he only looked at domestic firms, uh, to find out why they picked where they were and he identified the presence of universities as the single most important factor. Now interestingly, uh, one of my Rutgers colleagues who uh, is quite well known as a regional economist, Ann Markison, uh, did a study of location of high-tech firms using purely dis stati inferential statistics and she found that uh, there wasn't a correlation between universities and the presence of these firms and what it shows you is that it's a, it may be a necessary condition but it's not a sufficient condition so that where they cluster is where there are universities that do high tech, but just because they're universities that do it and train engineers uh, doesn't mean that firms will necessarily develop there. Uh, for example, one of the largest producers of engineers in the United States is a university called Purdue in West Lafayette, Indiana, which some of you may never have even heard of. Well, nobody really wants to be in West Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, and so uh, these engineers are all produced, but they all go somewhere else. Uh, and in that case, maybe Richard Florida's argument about creative cities applies uh, because they would much rather be in San Francisco or New York or Chicago than they would in West Lafayette. But you don't find out these things by running regressions, is the point I'm trying to make. Uh, so then, how can you generalize from case studies? And I'm going to give two examples of two books which are very good case studies, uh, both of which are quite old. Uh, one of them is called Tally's Corner, and this was done by an anthropologist who stood on a street corner in Washington, D.C. for a like, year or so with a bunch of guys who seemed to be unemployed. And he was trying to figure out why it was that levels of unemployment among African Americans was as high as it was, was one of the things he was trying to find out. Well, what he found out actually was that these people may look unemployed, but they aren't actually. They just don't like to talk about their jobs because their jobs are unpleasant. Uh, also, they tend to be day laborers and they tend to work on and off. Uh, but he was able to tell you a lot about the work lives and home lives and sex lives of these people on this corner. Now, 
he had no way of showing that this corner was the same as corners in Chicago or Melbourne or London or wherever, but you read that book and you're persuaded by the logic that he shows of why people like them lead the lives they do. So that you can generalize from it in terms of understanding the factors that will make people uh, essentially unambitious, why they are. So you may know unemployment statistics and you may be able to regress unemployment statistics against levels of education, for example, but it doesn't really get you into the motivations of people. Another example Sorry, of... Sorry, what was yeah, the book? Tally's Corner? Tally's Corner, yeah. Uh, spelt T-A-L-L-Y apostrophe S Corner and um, as my dotage is catching up with me, then Elliot Liebau is the author. And just to, just to catch that as it goes about generalizability from case studies, is the point that one wouldn't generalize the findings, or you don't have the authority from that single street corner case study, but you might generalize the questions. You might start asking those questions of other street corners. Exactly. And, but also because the logic that's presented there really persuades you that what the dynamic is that's going on. In other words, you can't say that if you went to a thousand street corners you'd find the same dynamic, but reading it, you think, well, yeah, this makes sense. This is how these people are motivated. Uh, another example by Herbert Gans, who's a very well-known urban sociologist, was called The Levittowners. It was written at a time when if you read uh, books like The Lonely Crowd or The Organization Man, you were told that everybody who lived in a suburb was basically a dullard and that uh, it was only uh, lack of imagination and conformity that led people to, leave, to live there. What he found was that the people in Levittown actually led pretty satisfactory lives that given their income, which was limited, these were working, this was a working class suburb, uh, that this was uh, a logical way for them to live and a satisfactory way uh, for them to live. It was also the time when Marcuse's book One Dimensional Man uh, said that people who led these kinds of lives were essentially uh, vapid and empty-headed. Yeah, uh, but uh, what he showed was the kinds of satisfactions they had, the kinds of motives they had, the way in which they led their lives and the way in which essentially intellectual snobbery uh, led uh, academics to sneer at, uh, at this form of life. Uh, there's a book on case studies by Robert Yin, which is a classic and is now in something like its fifth edition. What he says about case studies is that like experiments, they're generalizable to theoretical propositions, but they aren't generalizable to populations or universes. So to go back to the point I started out with, their purpose isn't to enumerate frequencies. Their purpose rather is to illuminate uh, the way, well, to lead you to making theories about human behavior. Uh, in my own work, which has been entirely case studies, except for the collab some of the collaborations I've done with my husband, Norman, who does the st went to MIT as an undergraduate in physics and therefore does the quantitative stuff when we do it. Uh, but I see doing a good case study as a kind of high-class journalism, journalism with footnotes, you might say. Uh, what you do is a form of triangulation. You ask questions of people until you keep getting the same answers, at which point you think, well, this is generally what is true. Uh, the key to it is linking what you find to developing propositions about uh, why what's happening is happening. I did a book called The City Builders in which I was looking at why property developers, real estate developers of big projects mainly, did what they did. So I interviewed uh, the heads of development firms, which was interest interesting people. Uh, and uh, what they generally said is, if anybody will lend me the money, I'll build. And this answer came up with such frequency that I was quite convinced uh, that this was the case. And when you think about it, since people who are developers are using other people's money, why not? 
Uh, it's, it's completely logical. But, but then I was curious, well, why did other people lend them the money uh, when often these projects were clearly going to go bust? And even I could see that they were going to go bust. So then I started interviewing financial institutions and I'd say, well, why, why are you lending money when it's clear that, the, and I looked at London and New York, it's clear that there's overbuilding and there's going to be a crash. Uh, they said, well, this project's going to work even if the others don't. Or, he's a man I can trust. Uh, and uh, one of the things actually about developers and financial institutions is that a lot of it is based on trust relations. Uh, if you're a developer, you don't just go shopping for a financial institution. Uh, generally, you have a couple that have been your backers all along, uh, so that these are the ones that, that you go to. And they're used to lending to you, so they keep doing it. Uh, so I could make an argument that, um, uh, that this was a case that could be generalized, but other people would actually have to go to other places to find out uh, if it occurs in other places. Yeah? So I have a question about generalization. Why do you think we need to generalize um, things? Uh, can't we just respect case studies and individuals' individuality? And isn't it um, sometimes, not, all, not always, undermining and ignoring individualities and a reductive perspective? And sometimes we just look so much for finding a pattern in behavior and stuff that we just reduce that. Okay, now that's a really interesting question, which actually nobody has asked me before. Why do we want to generalize? Uh, as social scientists, this is pretty much what we're supposed to, trained to do, I guess I would say, is make generalizations. But one of the problems of simply telling the story of a place is you're simply telling a story. Uh, so that might be interesting to the people who live there. Uh, just as, for example, your photograph album might be interesting to your family. Uh, but it might not be interesting to anyone else. Uh, the reason you want to generalize from it is to say that, well, other people who aren't in the exact same place as this uh, will be able to benefit from it, also can understand processes that go on uh, that might be applicable in some way to where, where they are. Uh, if, among historians, local history was always considered to be the least elevated form of doing history. Uh, in part because that's basically all it did is I grew up, for example, in Cleveland, Ohio. Well, if you live in Cleveland, the history of Cleveland's kind of interesting. Uh, but unless you want to generalize and say, well, Cleveland does represent a case of a city that um, flourished during the growth of industrialism and then declined dramatically once you had globalization, well, that'll tell you a story that's broader than simply, uh, well, these were the steel companies that opened in Cleveland and the car companies, and these are the people who worked for them. Uh, the attempt to generalize is, for one thing, to give yourself a framework for your story, what's important and what isn't. Uh, and what's important usually is a broader question than simply what happened. So local history tells you what happened, a more generalizable history tells you not only what happened, but allows you to make something more of what happened than simply uh, the local story. But I think that's a good question, and I think there is use to local history. There are lots of people who actually are local historians, and one of the things that you're really lucky if you're a social scientist is if you were trying to do a general more general case of a place, you stumble on one of them and they can turn over all this material that they, that they have. Uh, when Norman was doing, my husband was doing his PhD thesis, uh, he was looking at um, the transformation of an urban school was the topic, and he came on a woman who had apparently done oral histories of everybody who had been involved in this school for the last five years. Uh, as part of a project that she thought she was doing for the Columbia Oral History Project and then they weren't actually interested in it. So she just took the shopping bag out of her closet of transcripts of something like 200 interviews, which she then didn't have to do. There, there they were. Uh, now, you can generalize, but on the other hand, you have to always keep in mind that uh, you're talking about a particular moment in a particular historic period uh, that um, 
one of the things that we're most interested is, in as social scientists is what are the reasons for social change. Now, a factor might produce change in one context and not another. So a very well-known book by Albert Hirschman called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty says that if you want to reform an institution, let's say a school or a city, uh, that at some point exit works. Everybody says, okay, we're going to leave. We're going to withdraw from that school. We're going to leave that city and then the population will fall. Uh, but it, which is generally the market-based approach. The market-based approach, uh, which is of course religiously believed in by market ideologists, uh, would say, uh, well, uh, if customers don't like it, they won't buy it, and then whatever it is will have to change its ways. Uh, but that doesn't always work, in fact. Uh, so he talks also about voice, which is attempt using democracy, using social movements, uh, attempting to change something through pressure rather than through exit. Uh, and that these different strategies may work better or worse in different contexts at different times. Now, to talk a bit about, do you all know what the term positivism refers to in social science? Would anyone like me to elaborate or can I just use it? Don't be, basically positivism refers to hypothesis testing and I'll leave it at that. Uh, now what positivism can do is tell you, in fact, the frequency of, let's say, a particular kind of attitude. Uh, it can tell you what factors are and are not present at the same time but what it can't tell you is the effect of context, uh, where that can't be easily measured. Uh, so for example, um, Ezra Vogel, uh, who was a professor, I think still is, at the Harvard Business School, uh, did a book called Comeback, in which he attempted to find out what places had been in decline and then were able to come back. Uh, he looked at uh, what's called the Research Triangle in North Carolina. Uh, in which uh, uh, they managed in a place that was a tobacco state, which really was a very non-modern state, uh, they managed to create this cluster of research industries and innovation. Uh, he identifies particular kinds of leadership and uh, of educational institutions as being key to that study or to, to that um, development. Well, you wouldn't be able to find that out through simply hypothesis testing uh, because you can't really identify uh, whether or not leadership is present or not by simply running using the census or uh, using uh, Gallup polls uh, that you have to actually go look at the place. Uh, one of the studies that I worked on was called the Community Development Strategies Evaluation, which was an attempt by the US federal government to look at the impact of, um, of a particular grant program called the Community Development Block Grant. Well, it was a very heavily funded, very expensive evaluation, and almost all of it was based on the idea of using a statistical analysis to find out what strategies, quote, worked. Uh, so did planting trees make places uh, more economically viable? or did uh, spending on housing or spending on beautification or spending on this and that. And so they ran all these different strategies through their computers and worked in nine cities and it had uh, surveys and interviews. I mean, it was this huge collection of data and basically they didn't find anything. Uh, while uh, the one part of it that I worked on was doing case studies of citizen participation in the nine cities and we learned a lot about those cities. We also learned in which cities they discriminated against certain neighborhoods and in others that they didn't, which cities had active neighborhood leadership and which didn't, what difference where they did have active neighborhood leadership it made. Uh, and uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development was actually not happy uh, with our findings because we could actually name names and say which mayors were effective and which ones weren't. And from the point of view of the federal government, this was nothing they ever really wanted to know 
at all. Uh, but the point here is that correlation is not causation, and to understand the causal nexus, you really have to go look at places very carefully. Uh, so the question then becomes, how do you select your cases? Well, I gave you uh, the example to begin with of this um, effort to identify why corp financial corporations clustered where they did. Uh, so starting out with uh, doing multiple cases uh, allows you to uh, identify similarities, similarities and differences in their causes, while a single case uh, allows you to look at dynamics more closely. Uh, the book I mentioned, The City Builders, looks at London and New York, and what the finding I found in a way most interesting was that the outcomes were the same in both places in terms of the kinds of development that occurred in that period that I was looking at, uh, the 1980s and 1990s, but the institutional systems were completely different. Uh, so uh, even though there's a tendency, if you're a political scientist, to think that how institutions are formed is what makes differences, and if you have different institutions, you'll have different results, uh, in fact, that wasn't the case there. Uh, that rather what was crucially important was ideology. And in both cases, what you had was an ideology that says that if you build big developments, uh, that growth will trickle down and that this is the secret to uh, creating economic development. It was the period where office-based economic development planning was uh, what everybody was doing, and then later it became creativity. Um, let's see where I want to go from here. Uh, I'll tell you another uh, case study that I just finished supervising. Uh, was an Indian woman who was looking at corridor development in India. That is, uh, what you're seeing in India is that along the highways that are connecting major cities, uh, there's an enormous amount of development of office parks, of um, gated communities, of um, all kinds of real estate development. Uh, and what you also have are multiple jurisdictions and no particular form of planning. Uh, and uh, what's been most publicized in journalism is uh, that there's basically a battle between the farmers and the developers. Uh, the farmers are getting their lands confiscated. Uh, it's being bought using eminent domain or uh, compulsory purchase at uh, the market price for agricultural land and then it's being developed and it gets, moves up to the market price of developed land. Uh, but she found some examples where there wasn't antagonism between farmers and developers uh, because, in fact, the farmers had formed cooperatives. Uh, so that she identified this approach as being one which you might call a win-win approach in that the farmers would move off their land and become the shareholders of a development company in collaboration with, uh, with experienced property developers, and therefore, as their land gained value, they would also gain profits from it. She also found, which was an interesting, surprising to her finding, was that the Dalits, the lowest caste farmers, uh, benefited the most from this because they owned the worst land for farming, but it was the best land for development. Uh, so uh, she's been, she's now using this as a, as a a way to promote the strategy of cooperative development, and what it shows is that in some contexts, uh, that um, uh, having land taken over, in fact, does not harm the people who are there, except for, of course, those who don't own any land at all, who uh, were the ones who came out the worst in this. But what she was able to do was to say who benefits from this form of development, and under what circumstances do different groups benefit. Uh, Brendan showed you my book, The Just City. Uh, I started out with a question. You can, yeah, Cornell University Press, if anyone <laughs> cares to acquire it. Uh, that um, my purpose was to find out what principles could guide planners in producing a city that was more just. Uh, so I began by really developing abstractly what I would call principles of justice by which to evaluate policies. 
Uh, then I looked at three cities, New York and London and Amsterdam, uh, all of which I had studied in the past, and attempted to evaluate, to, to um, use the criteria I had developed in order to say what they did better, what they did worse, and in some way to make what you might call a justice impact statement as opposed to an environmental impact statement. Uh, I don't want to take too much longer because I really want to open this up to discussion, but I'll go back a minute to my mention of the book The City Builders. Uh, what I did there uh, was develop what uh, in the literature called a natural experiment. Uh, so I took three districts in New York and three districts in London which matched up. Uh, so Spitalfields in London uh, is the poorest ward in London, but it's just adjacent to the city of London, that is just adjacent to the financial district. And I compared it to a part of Brooklyn in New York, uh, which also uh, was one of the poorest areas uh, in the city, but which was comparable uh, to Spitalfields in that it was being redeveloped for the purpose of office development. I took Times Square in New York, and matched it up with King's Cross in London, and I took Battery Park City in New York, which is a mega development, and matched it with uh, Canary Wharf, uh, both of which actually were done by the same developers. Uh, so I could ask, uh, what was the relationship between economic restructuring and property development uh, in these two cities, London and New York, and how did it play itself out uh, in these three, in each of these six neighborhoods. Uh, so I asked these questions. How do developers select their product projects? Uh, what were the causes and consequences of the property cycle? Because what we know always in property is there are booms and busts, although Australia seems to only having boom. Uh, but eventually, <laughs> eventually there will be a bust because there always is. Uh, so what difference does it make uh, whether you're investing while doing this upward tra trajectory or the downward one. And how do we explain why it is that people keep investing when the crash is virtually inevitable? Uh, one of the things I could identify was the contradictions between the logic of the firm and the logic of the industry as a whole. Then I was very concerned with how government programs affected the motivations of development because what you see very much in the United States and I don't know enough about Australia to really say, but everything was public-private partnerships, and public-private partnerships generally means that the public gives up a lot, and the private sector gains a lot. What role do planners and architects play in this process? Uh, then how did we explain, and I mentioned this to you before, uh, the similarities given the very different institutional structures I also explored what are the special characteristics of the real estate industry, uh, which I think I got right because I was later invited by the British Property Federation, which is the organization of big time property developers in the United Kingdom, uh, to speak to their annual meeting at a five star golf resort in Wales. And this was to my astonishment. Uh, but the guy who invited me, who was the uh, executive officer of um, the Grosvenor Estate, which is an enormously wealthy uh, a, a property company in, um, in London owned by the Duke of Westminster. Uh, he said, well, I was in a bookstore. He saw a book called The City Builders, so since that's what he did, he thought he'd look at it. And then he looked at the chapter saying, what were the characteristics of the real estate industry? He thought I was right. Uh, so he invited me to give this talk. Usually, since I'm rather critical most of the time, uh, property developers don't generally invite me to their meetings, but in this case, uh, they did. Uh, I'm doing a comparison right now with a fellow who used to be my doctoral student and now is in the Technical University of Berlin, uh, comparing Jersey City in uh, New Jersey, New, the United States, with Danau City in Vienna. Uh, what you see is if you looked at the pictures of the two of them, you'd say, my goodness, I don't know which is in which place. Uh, so these are similar developments in that they are 
on the periphery rather than at the center. That is, Jersey City is across the Hudson River from Manhattan. Danau City is where the peripheral highway is around Vienna. The context couldn't be more different. Austria is a social democracy. There's a huge commitment to public housing. Uh, but nevertheless, the projects are similar, so the question, and I haven't answered it yet, is how to explain uh, the similarity in urban form uh, that's going on in the two places. Uh, so, uh, here are some issues then, and this is going to be my conclusion, of using case study methodology that uh, cities and regions, and here again, I think it goes to this question, why not just local history? Uh, that they're nested within national and global systems. So that uh, there's a tendency, if you just focus on the city, to forget what the overarching system is. Uh, so we can have theories of why, of how power works in the city, so you tend to identify local power holders, you focus on local politics, but local politics and local power holding is very much structured by national and global factors. And so you always have to, at the end, tie back what you found in the locality to uh, more general uh, political economic processes. Uh, then finally, let me say that most knowledge about cities results from the accretion of case studies. So that you can develop stories about different places uh, or you can develop different stories about similar places. And the case study's usefulness, I think, depends on the capacity, the capability of the storyteller uh, to be convincing, uh, to be able to trace a logic that says, okay, we've had deindustrialization in old central cities uh, in the Midwest of the United States or in Eastern Europe. Some of them have managed to restructure themselves and others haven't. So how do we explain that Chicago has done pretty well, Minneapolis has done pretty well, Cleveland has done poorly, and Detroit is a total disaster? What, you know, what are the reasons why that's the case? So what you do in comparative case studies is, is really attempt to find similarities and differences. Now uh, there's a fellow now at Oxford named Bent Flubia, spelled F-L-Y-B-J-E-R-G, and why he pronounces it Flubia, I can't tell you, except that he's Danish and that seems to be how he pronounces it. Uh, but at any rate, he and Robert Yin have attempted to schematize development and case study uh, so that you can do them somewhat mechanically in the same way that you can do cost-benefit analysis mechanically. Uh, but I'm not sure that you actually can. Uh, that doing a really good case study where people read it and say, aha, I, I really understood now something that I didn't understand is, is in fact an art form. Uh, so it requires experience and it requires sensitivity to nuance. It requires you picking out uh, whatever variables seem to matter and don't matter and then making a convincing case as you would in a certain way if you were a lawyer writing a brief. A convincing case that what you found and how you explain it is in fact what was going on and is the appropriate explanation. So I will stop there. Um, Susan's left us time very uh, graciously for discussion, so has anyone got anything they want to raise by comment or question? And while you're thinking about that, can I just say, during the mix-up, and I apologise for this you know, trial by AV mix-up just earlier, and apologise to all of you for that, but we did a little straw poll and see what sort of case studies people are doing. Now, most people here are doing, or a lot of people are doing a case study in a, uh, Australia and a case, uh, comparative case mm -hmm. study in Australia and overseas. So multi-country multi -country case studies. Um, you just nominated one then yourself with the Austrian and yeah. US example. What issues emerge in your mind um, in that kind of approach, um, including, for example, just coming up with a banal uh, finding that they do things differently <laughs> there, you know? How, what, how do we make meaning of a cross-country yeah. case study? Well, what's perhaps more interesting than that they do things differently is that they do things the same. Mm. And so if you have very different places which do things the same, then you might try to identify 
those factors which somehow cause them to do the same. Uh, I guess I would say right now the factor worldwide uh, that's causing in terms of development places to do the same is the triumph of neoliberal ideology that uh, what we've seen since the middle 1970s is that, uh, well, two things. One is uh, the demise of the Soviet system, uh, which meant that there wasn't an outside threat which said, well, gee, if you don't, if you aren't a little more welfare oriented and redistribution oriented, then communists are gonna come and, uh, and take away your property. Uh, so the threat is gone. And at the same time, we've had uh, economists become within policy circles uh, totally triumphant in terms of their argument that we have to, quote, get the prices right, uh, that the market is the most efficient way of allocating resources, uh, that uh, regulation does nothing but raise prices, it doesn't make things better. Uh, so that uh, this ideology, which is so part of the world that people see that, you know, don't even see alternatives to it, but simply see it as natural, as the way things are, uh, I think more than anything explains why we see the same thing going on in so many places. Uh, so that even those places like Amsterdam and Stockholm, which I had used all along as examples of places that had different outcomes, now are increasingly having the same outcomes as, as London or New York. Yes. So, when analyzing our case studies, is it necessary to go through a certain range of criteria for discussing the case studies, or is it fine to just go through the case studies based on what is the highlight of that case study? Um, you know, like like you go to different field work to different um, cases, and like each of them has a highlight, like a range of interesting, significant aspects. And th there is this perception that when you're discussing and you know, like studying the case study, there, there needs to be this criteria that I'm gonna go through all these criteria and analyze them based on this list of criteria. But while in the, in the real world, you can just see that, well, no, each of the case studies are actually interesting in a different way. I can't. Well, I think that how you proceed is inductively. And so as you might start out with one kind of tentative criterion, as you call it, but I would say, you might say hypothesis, and change it. So that uh, in my doctoral dissertation, my PhD dissertation was on the movement for community control of schools in New York. And it was done in a period when there was a huge amount of uproar over white bureaucracies going into black neighborhoods and telling people what to do. So what you had were, was a system in New York where all the principals of schools except one uh, were white. Most of the teachers were also. And the student body was predominantly black, not only predominantly black and Hispanic, but a substantial majority black and Hispanic. Uh, so the argument that parents were making who were really upset about the education that their children were not getting was that uh, it was a form of colonialism that uh, what they needed to do was take control of the schools themselves. So the Ford Foundation set up in its very nice technical, uh, technocratic fashion, it said, well, what we'll do is a controlled experiment where we will establish three community controlled school districts and we'll do a before and an after to see if education improves. So um, I decided, well, that's what I do, is I do the before and the after, and I'd look at test scores to see if um, one could find that there was an improvement in test scores as a consequence of this new regime. Uh, well, uh, to begin with, there were what you might call distorting events, namely the teachers went on strike for three months uh, because they were so basically upset over the effort to impose community control on them. The un so you had a very much a union against community uh, situation. And uh, I changed what I was looking at in my thesis from being uh, what are the 
you might say, technical effects of community control to a thesis on urban social movements and how are movements formed, uh, what um, makes a difference with whether they succeed or fail. Uh, so I interviewed all the people on these community school boards and I really interviewed them in terms of a literature about social movements rather than a literature about education. Uh, so that was a, a change that was caused by what I found out there. Uh, this woman I was talking about with the highway corridors in India, well she had started out, she was going to look at housing on the corridors and what were the effects of uh, these new developments on the housing of low-income people and she completely changed what she was looking at as she stumbled onto, which she didn't really at the beginning know existed, uh, this cooperative that had been established outside Pune uh, where they did land readjustment and uh, uh, the farmers became investors in property development. Uh, so uh, it isn't that you start out with some rigid set of things that you're looking for and don't change them, you do change them, but you also pick out the things that seem really important and interesting and in which then you can say something that might be useful in other places. So what she can say is that this formation of cooperatives is something that other places with large amounts, well, with all this peripheral real estate development going on, uh, can in fact look to as a method for more equitably distributing the benefits of development. Uh, I asked this, well, I'm still trying to frame the question. Uh, these students all have to confront a fairly demanding uh, ethics process, yeah, and they will be required to specify in advance the questions they ask. Now, you described situations where, in fact, whoops, no, hang on, those weren't perhaps the, the questions that are best asked, and the question should change. Um, at Harvard, is there some sort of... Oh yes, every American university has so-called human subjects review. Before you can embark on any research project, you have to take and watch a uh, video and then take an exam. Uh, the, of course, the whole review process is based on a model of medical school uh, where uh, you know, they're really concerned with whether you're injecting people with drugs or what they didn't consent to, but they've generalized it because the model of science so permeate social science that uh, in very bad ways, if you ask me. But the result is that you do, you have to submit your questionnaire, you have to have a letter that you give to each person you interview uh, saying that the results will be kept confidential and that they'll never be named, etc., etc. And uh, if it really goes into more personal kinds of things, that it will be kept anonymously in some vault somewhere. I mean, it's very complicated. But of course, nobody really knows what you're doing once you're actually doing it. <laughs> so that uh, you, know, you can get away with a lot, essentially. I mean, you should be ethical, but, uh, but going, jumping through all these hoops after a while gets silly. I mean, theoretically, if you change your questionnaire, you go back to the Human Subjects Review Committee and you wait another couple of months while they f go through it again. Uh, and it all delays the process a lot. Uh, but uh, you, know, you can vary from it if you don't do something egregious that's gonna cause whoever it is you're interviewing to call up the university and say, this person is uh, you know, doing something really embarrassing to me. I have to say, particularly since we're being filmed, this is recorded, you were told to behave ethically, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just perhaps one or two more because we <coughs> think you're heading on to another appointment soon. But yeah, these two guys. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps you in terms of once you've you started to collect a lot of your, your data, you've done a lot of interviews and you're interpreting results. Um, what do you think about sort of individual structured interpretation versus more, you know, talking about primary findings to other PhD students and that sort of thing? Uh, well, I mean, I've had plenty of students who go with their recorder and record everything verbatim and then transcribe it and to me that's really kind of a waste of time. Uh, so what I tend to do is, I mean, it's not bad to have a backup by recording, but I take notes and I just use the notes and if you're really good, you, when you come home you put the notes into the computer instead of letting them pile up. Uh, in terms of 
I didn't quite understand the question I'm sharing. I'm trying to ask, like, we've got a workshop at the State of Australian Cities Conference coming up for PhD students. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering to get the most out of that, like, to actually talk about your findings. Oh, sure. And that sort of thing. Do you think that's important? I think that's, the more you can do it, the better. Uh, and I've always encouraged my students to give papers at conferences. Uh, it, uh, not only does it give you practice in presenting, which then when you're in the job market is useful to have had, uh, but it also exposes you to how others present things. Uh, I don't see, you know, people worry an awful lot that somebody's going to steal their ideas. Uh, but that doesn't really, that isn't really nearly the problem that, the, that people think it is. Uh, that the more you can actually have interchange, uh, the better, and the more that you're subject what you're doing to critique, the better. So, yes. Yeah, good. And you, sir? Oh, yes. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I, I've often heard people sort of um, argue for case study approaches as a kind of a corrective to um, the rigidity of top-down mm -hmm. approaches, that if you can have the sort of grounded theory um, highlighted through real-life practice, that's mm -hmm. more valuable than purely abstracted theory. Um, I just wanted to know if you could sort of see what you see as the relationship between that kind of more um, mm -hmm. universalizing theory yeah. and the... Well, I tried to do both in my book. That is, it starts out really very abstract and looks at theories of justice from people like Rawls and Nancy Fraser and Iris Marion Young and makes a very general argument as to why justice should be the, cri the most important criterion for evaluating policy. So that's on a purely abstract level. And then I try to move to say what would be a theory of urban justice. So you might say deducing from that a three criteria which I call democracy, diversity, and equity, and then going into the case studies and being able then to move backwards towards those uh, criteria. I think that abstract theory is valuable, but the problem with abstract theory is that uh, it doesn't necessarily tell you what to do in any real situation. And so, uh, I think you do just need to do both. You need to be both deductive and inductive and to move, it's hard to move back and forth. Very quick, quick question. Yes. <laughs> you, you talk about triangulation. How, how important is triangulation? Must we always triangulate our, uh, what we do in a case study? And if you can't close it with a third point, you know? Does it you well, yeah. yeah, what it really just means is that you shouldn't say something until you're pretty convinced that it's, uh, that it's accurate. That's <laughs> 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 what it means. And just because one person said something to you doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually the case. Okay, well, we'll pull up there, just as we do. Um, uh, I'll invite you to thank Professor Feinstein in just a second, but just to remind you that um, Norman Feinstein, who as it turns out, happens to share a name, but also you refer to him as your husband, so we can <laughs> talk about that publicly. Um, right. He's giving what will be an important lecture tomorrow. Um, what time is that? That's uh, yeah, one o'clock. One o'clock on public housing in Hong Kong. Hong Kong and Singapore. Singapore. Well worth attending, please, in the faculty. So look At the open those. stage. What's that? At the open stage. Open stage, so please keep that in mind. Um, and also, um, still plenty of room for uh, Thursday night for Professor Feinstein's uh, lecture on the Just City. So please sign up for that. Uh, with that, we'll um, send her on away for now and thank her and apologise yet again for that AV mix-up. So thanks again, Susan. You are very welcome. <laughs>